Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David Kinney, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And you are watching us on YouTube. And so we thank you for tuning in this morning. Last week, I talked a little bit about being childlike. Not childish, childlike. And what we could learn from watching children live, watching them move about. And it was a positive message. It was an upbeat message. And we looked at that because now Jesus is going to shift gears and be a little bit more harsh. And for the next few weeks, we're going to read a passage known as the seven woes of the religious leaders. The seven woes are judgments. And they're uh, against the current religious leaders of Jesus' time. And Jesus is going to make the argument that they have failed in their leadership roles. They have failed to lead the people. Now, you could say, well, why are we going to study this? You'd, you'd say, well, there's, there's, there are no Pharisees today. And surely the teachings of the Pharisees have died away with them. And I'd like to think so. But the truth is the teachers may have died, but their teaching lives on. And most of the time, I think what's worse is it becomes the voice that we tell ourselves. Sometimes the worst thing we learn is the thing we teach ourselves. Matthew 23, it says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That would mean the seat of leadership or the seat of authority. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But, Jesus says, do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? That sounds terrible. And these are very serious claims. Yes, that's true. But that's nothing <laughs> compared to what he's going to say next. This is some serious stuff. Watch this. Verse 13 and 14. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, you yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Wow! This is not the let the little children come to me, Jesus, that we read about last week. This is not the happy, airbrushed Jesus. This is a, almost kind of an angry Jesus, and he's very serious, and he's giving a very strict warning to the religious leaders. So let's look at this. Jesus says the religious leaders have a teaching that he says is tied up, cumbersome, load. Now, in the Greek, those words are beris, forton, despaskatos. That doesn't sound like something I would want laid on top of me, right? Do you want to carry the beris, forcion, despaskatos? <laughs> No, it sounds heavy, right? Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. What's a hypocrite? Well, Wikipedia says it's the false appearance of virtue or goodness, all the while concealing the real character traits or inclinations, especially with respect to religious and moral beliefs. Hence, in a general sense, hypocrisy may involve dissimulation pretense, or a sham. In other words, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you phonies. Right? He says, you're fake. Why are they fake? And Jesus is going to tell us. Because you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Well, what's that? What's, what's the kingdom of heaven? Well, if you want to know what Jesus means, then you should ask Jesus. You, you go back to the teaching of Jesus about what he says the kingdom of heaven is, or rather what the kingdom of heaven is like. 
And he's mentioned it a couple of times. Jesus says in Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. What does Jesus say that the kingdom of heaven is like? He says the kingdom of heaven is like being on a search for the most valuable and most priceless thing. He says it's treasure. It brings great joy. It's, it's valuable, right? For Jesus, his fundamental point for the kingdom of God is if you could think of anything, you won't think of anything better. And when you search and you find it, you're going to rearrange your entire life just to have it, just to be a part of it. And Jesus is speaking now to the religious leaders of his day, people who should have all the answers, people who should be community leaders, people who should be spiritual leaders. And he tells them, there are people out there and they are searching for the kingdom of God and they come to you to find it. And they think you have this great treasure, but you're all phonies. And when the people come to you, rather than help them, you slam the door in their faces. He tells them, you make the treasure hard to find. Jesus also says that their teaching is heavy and burdensome. And this makes Jesus angry. Last week, we talked about how God is the parent and we are like the child and God wants us to approach the kingdom, enter the kingdom like a child. Here, Jesus tells the religious leaders, I have treasure for my children and you are keeping it from them. This is a very harsh thing to say, isn't it? But is it a fair thing to say? Because I seem to remember that Jesus' own teaching wasn't always easy either. I mean, love your enemies? Turn the other cheek? Is it fair to say that this teaching is heavy and burdensome when it seems like Jesus' teaching is also hard? Well, let's look at that claim for a second. Let's look at the teachings of Jesus and how he taught and compare that with the Pharisees. One day Jesus is talking to the crowds and he feeds them. And then he begins comparing what took place with the Exodus and the manna that fell from the sky and about Moses. And he says, you know, one day there's going to be a new Exodus. There's going to be a new Moses, a new Messiah to follow. And then he begins speaking about eating his own flesh, and drinking his blood. Wah, right? But let's look. John 6. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And then verse 60 says, On hearing this, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? The crowds say, This is hard stuff. This is difficult stuff. We don't understand. The crowds listen to Jesus, and then they say, Ah, my brain hurts. I just, I don't get it. Right? And Jesus is upset with the religious leaders of their day for having heavy and burdensome teaching. But Jesus' own teaching is hard. That's true. It is hard. But it's not heavy. And that's the difference. Let's look at another one. Jesus is dining with Mary and Martha. 
Luke 10 says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Martha is worrying. Last week we talked about worry and how it doesn't help our lives to worry, it doesn't help to be busy, but rather God says, leave all the worry to your parents, leave all the worry to me. Jesus says, Martha, your, your life is spinning out of control. You are, you are compulsive, you're, you're losing it, just slow down, take it easy. Jesus said we should approach the kingdom like children. Children can focus on today. And they've found this miraculous way to not stress, but to leave all that worry and that stress to their parents. And here, in this teaching, Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't beat around the bush. He begins with, Martha, Martha. So he's not talking to anybody else in the room. He's very direct. And he says, you are worried about a great many things. Jesus' teaching is hard and it's confrontive. Jesus' teaching is confrontive, but it's not heavy. What else? Here's another example. Jesus and his disciples have been fishing all night and they haven't caught anything. Luke 5, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Notice in this, Jesus barely says a thing. Where's the teaching? How is this an example of his teaching? I mean, it's not, it's not really there. Maybe, but this is an example of his presence. This is an example of Jesus' authority. And it causes those who are with him to fall down and worship him. Jesus is convicting. Jesus' teaching is hard, it's confrontive, and it's convicting. Because Peter says, I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. Yes, Jesus' teaching is all these things. It is hard. And it was in your face. It was personal. And just being in his presence brought you to your knees and made you realize you weren't worthy to be near him. But Jesus wasn't mad at the religious leaders for any of those reasons. No, Jesus was mad at the religious leaders because they made their message heavy and inaccessible. Because for Jesus, the gospel should not be about packing it on. It's not about making the load heavier. Jesus felt the gospel should be lifting the burden off, making the load lighter. The gospel should not be about adding, but subtracting, not burdensome, freeing. Listen to how Paul says it and how Paul talks about the gospel to the church of Colossae. Colossians 2 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your sinful nature was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him. Through your faith 
in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Paul says this free message is not about making you feel guilty. It's not about beating you up. It's not about making you feel worse. It is a lifting. It is a celebration about all the things that Christ has already done for us. The good news should be good. Amen? It's about what God has done for us in Christ. Paul says you are no longer dead. You are alive. You were empty and now you're full. Colossians chapter 1 says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the good news is not about what you are not. It's about who Christ is, and Christ is hope. This should shape the way that you see yourself. This should really change the voices that you hear. Because it's not about how you don't measure up. It's about how Christ fulfills you. It's about how Christ makes you whole. It's about how Christ completes you. It's not about who you failed. It's about how Christ restores. It's not heavy. It's about hope. It's not about who you are not or where you fall short. It's not a burden on your shoulders. It's about who you are now that Christ has lifted you up. Jesus said these religious leaders close the door to hope. There are people searching for the good news, people searching for the kingdom. And he said, your teaching is heavy and burdensome. My question would be to us, do we speak those heavy words to ourselves? We need to stop listening to that voice that says that you and I don't measure up. That's a burden. That's heavy speak. And this is the teaching that Jesus is speaking against. Jesus doesn't like heavy words. What's the good news? The good news is Colossians 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We're down here and we're feeling bad about what we are doing, about how we're acting and what we look like. And we're beating ourselves up when we look in the mirror. But Colossians says, if you are truly hiding behind Christ and God looks at you, God looks in your direction, who does he see? Does he even see you? Colossians says, God sees Jesus. Your life is hidden with Christ. So Christianity is not about being good enough. Christianity is not even being Christian enough. It's not about the heavy load of religion that it makes you carry and that you need to remember. I need to remember a hundred Bible verses and then you feel guilty. You know, I only remember 99. In Christ, you've already made it. You've already succeeded. You've already arrived. Colossians says, you're in glory. That means you've made it. I know there are a lot of self-help books out there, both in the secular world and in the Christian world. You might have even listened to self-help pastors on TV and they give self-help sermons. But don't be fooled. There are no seven ways to make you perfect. There is no three ways to a better salvation. There is only one way, and it's in Christ. And you are already restored in him. You're already better. You're already perfect. Anyone who teaches you that there is more work to do, there's more steps to take, there's more hoops to jump through before you're accepted or you're welcomed or you're loved or you're saved. They are placing a heavy burden on your shoulders. The true gospel takes the load off. 
And if this is still confusing to you, Jesus says it in Matthew 25 as clearly as he can. He says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What's his, what's his burden? What's his yoke? It's, it's his teaching. It's his path. It's the, it's the Christian road. The, the word yoke was the wood that you put around an animal's neck so that that animal could pull your cart, pull your load. An animal has to struggle and pull your burden. Jesus was comparing his way with their way or, or the way that would be the world's way. Jesus says, I don't do religion like that. The good news is not a burden. The good news is light. But well, we can't believe it. You know, I mean, what, what did your dad always say? Nothing in this world is free, right? Or you don't get something for nothing. Or you get what you pay for. Again, that's the world. And I think the Bible wants to make it perfectly clear for you. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. That is crystal clear, right? Don't, and you should, we should see that. It's not about doing something that I need to do to make something happen. The something that I'm looking for has already happened. Corinthians says the old is gone, the new is here. Not the new is coming, the new is here. The religious leaders say, you don't pray enough. You don't read your Bible enough. You don't have a quiet time, right? You don't give enough. And then you feel guilty. You feel guilty. You feel the weight. You feel the heaviness. You need to eat those foods, not those foods. You need to take this many steps to the store. You need to worship on this day, not that day. You need to read this. Don't read that. You need to cut your hair like this. You need to wear your hair like this. You need to wear only these fabrics. You need to do this when you're sick. You need to raise your kids like this. You need to pray like this. The religious leaders had 613 laws to follow. God gave them 10. The religious leaders found 603 more. Long to-do lists are only helpful if you're trying to get things done. And Jesus says, the work's already done. The Bible says, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. The gospel will never be about handing you a new set of things that eventually makes you feel terrible about yourself. Jesus carries away all the heavy stuff. It's not about pointing out your sin and making you carry this heavy load that makes you feel bad about yourself. Because God announces that the work is already finished. Ephesians 2 says, for it is by grace. Grace means gift. It's the word charis. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You have been saved by God. This verse says you are God's handiwork. The Greek word here, where it says you are a piece of work. You ever had someone say that to you? You're a piece of work. The Bible says that too. You are a piece of work. It's the word poeo. It's where we get the word poem. Meaning, meaning what? Meaning you're a piece of work. You're a work of art. You're a thing of beauty. Okay, so we got all that. How do we then make it applicable? I mean, what's the takeaway today? What can we learn? What, how do we apply this? Because I think as Christians, our job is to put flesh and blood on Jesus in the world. Our job is to take his grace out into the world. And it's how we live. 
It's how we interact with the world. Even a COVID-19 world, even a, a politically divided world, where we are right now, we as Christians should be making the visual beauty that is Jesus. You're okay. You are made complete in Christ. It's all been taken care of. He is the hope of glory and he resides in you. That's the gospel. And so knowing all that, we need to continue to do the work that Christ has laid out for us. We need to continue to bring this good news to the world. We need to advance God's kingdom, bring God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, right? And so we should be thinking about how can I relieve that person's burden? I see that person weighed down. I see that person feeling guilty and stressed and pressure. And if I could just relieve this person's burden, if I could just make them feel better, if I could just reassure them, then I would be doing the same thing that Jesus came to do. This is a broken world. This is a broken world by design. And, it, and it's made to make you feel bad. It's made to make you chase your tail, to run in circles. This world is made to make you confused, to make you keep guessing. You know, I, people right now, I, I hear them saying, I don't know which drummer to follow. I don't know who to believe, right? Jesus came to speak against all of those heavy messages. And the church of Jesus, he gives us the resources. He gives us the energy. He gives us the wealth. And he gives us the compassion to do that work. We don't share the good news to prove that we're Christians. We don't share the good news to earn salvation. We do it because it's a natural progression of the maturity that we grow into because we realize that we've been set free. You know, we're, we're escaped felons running around with a key that opens up locked doors, that opens up handcuffs, and we're so excited to have this key. We're just running from cell to cell and letting people go. That's what Christians do. We are made complete already. We are made perfect already. We carry the light inside of us all ready. So we go out into the world and we continue to bring wholeness. We continue to relieve burdens. We continue to set the captives free. You're a poem. You're a piece of work in Jesus. And we go out into the world and we share that beauty and we continue to bring wholeness to the world. Last week we heard Jesus say, let the little children come to me, right? Jesus did not close the door. Jesus did not make it difficult. Jesus constantly brought in people from the outside. If people were on the other side of the ring, he brought them into his circle. He never cast anyone away. He welcomed them all. He says the kingdom of God is for anyone. It's like something valuable that when they find it, they rearrange their entire life just to be a part of it. And Jesus wanted to make that treasure available to everyone. Salvation and freedom was available to all, even children. And today Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, anyone who feels like the weight of the world, the teaching of religion right, is heavy and cumbersome, he says, come to me. My teaching is light. My kingdom is available. My kingdom is free. It's yours. It's going to bring freedom. It's going to bring release. You're going to feel better. Jesus was mad at the voices. Jesus was mad at the negative voices, the voices that close doors, the voices that keep the kingdom out of reach. Jesus was mad at the religious leaders that made religion 
a heavy, boring, tiring burden. And Jesus was mad because that was not the kingdom of God. Jesus says the kingdom of God is treasure. And it's a joy that when you find it, even in a difficult time, you'd do anything. You'd do anything to have it. And he promises that in life, he is going to lift and carry as much of the weight as he can. And I think part of the struggle for us is letting him. I think right now, you and I are trying to carry that burden ourselves. We're trying to do everything we can to make it and live and survive and exist on our own. And he's just waiting to carry more of that burden. And so I would just invite you to lay that burden down. But if you're a follower of Christ, that you would relinquish it, that you would let it go, that you would lay it at the foot of Jesus, that you would be like Mary, that you would sit at the feet of Jesus and say, it's all about you. All the business that's happening behind me, I don't even want to be a part of it. I just want to sit here and be with you. And we give all of that burden to Christ because he can carry it. And if you're not a Christian, you're not a follower of Jesus, maybe this is not the message that you're used to hearing. Maybe you thought this was about jumping through hoops. Maybe you thought this was about reaching that next rung on the ladder or perfecting yourself in some way, or maybe it was a long list of do's and do nots, and you just said, you know what, I don't, I don't have that kind of time. And maybe you're hearing for the very first time that following Jesus is about freedom. It's about lighter living, about less burdensome living. Then I would tell you that following him is easy. There can be difficulty ahead, sure, because as we heard, Jesus' teaching is hard. It is confronting. It is challenging. It is convicting. But it's worth it because it's freeing. All those things aren't bad. They end up freeing you. And you live with more joy and more peace. And I would say if that's the life you want, following Christ is as easy as A, B, C. In A, we admit. We admit that we're a sinner. Romans 3 says, all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. And there's no shame in that. There's no shame in saying you're not perfect. There's no shame in saying that you can't do it by yourself, that you need others. Church, that's what church is. Church is just a place that's made up of other broken people who've all admitted that they need Christ. We all admit that we're broken. We all admit that we're hurting. And then we believe. We believe that there is a higher power that can lift that burden off of us, a higher power that can take that sin and pain away and that can restore us. And we believe that that is Jesus. Acts 4 says there is no salvation by anyone else. There is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. You can believe that. You can believe that Christ stands ready to offer you life, that his words are lifting, that his words release your burden, his teaching is light, and that if you follow him, you're making the better choice. Then the only thing you have left to do is to tell him. The Bible calls that confession. You confess Christ as your Lord and Savior. Romans 10 says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Belief and confession, those are the cornerstones of Christianity. That's all it means to be saved. It's never been about how good you are. It's never been about how much you give. It's never been about how long you've been a Christian. We are not saved by anything that we do, right? Like we already read, it's a gift. This is a gift. And it's only about what Christ did on the cross. If that sounds like the life you want, then I want to invite you to bow your head and pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, and thank you for coming to rescue me from that life of sin. I want to live my life following you. 
I want to live my life listening to your teaching because it is light and freeing. And I want to place all my trust in you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for the free gift of grace. Thank you for the free gift of salvation. Thank you for the free gift of eternal life. Amen. Well, I would say if you prayed that prayer or you simply want to know what it means to be a follower of Jesus, then I would invite you to go deeper in your faith. Join a local church. Tell someone in your life uh, that you know is a Christian, that you want to learn more about what it means to follow Jesus. And I would say you are on the right path. I love you guys. I'll see you soon. Bye.